day today and how wonderful it is to be able to come and gather together to worship God on a day like today. It is so beautiful. It just reminds us that we have so much to be thankful for. Um, and, and at one stage I suggest that we all pick up our chairs and go sit outside in the car park, but, but it might be a little bit too hot <laughs> for us out there. So thank goodness the heating wasn't switched on this morning. Um, oh, is it? Oh. <laughs> well, for the folks sitting in the middle of the mess, we love you this. Um, for everybody else stuck next to a heater, um, you can go sit outside, it's cooler outside. <laughs> um, lovely to be with you this morning and uh, to worship God together, just to be in His presence and know that, that, that He is our Father in heaven and He loves us and He calls us to Him and, and just embraces us. So, so we're going to be still for a few moments and we're just going to recognize that we are in the presence of a living and loving God. Loving God, we commit this time to you as a time of worship, as a time of recognizing that we are in your presence. We are always in your presence, but we're here today to worship you. And, and, and just to lay our lives before you. And I pray, God, that we will just be blessed today, that we will leave this place knowing that God has been here with us and he has been stirring inside of us and he has drawing us deeper and deeper into our love for him and, and, and deeper in our understanding of him. And, and so draw us together as your people who have come to worship you today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our opening hymn together, um, and, and last time uh, there was a bit of confusion over this because I told Ruth we were going to sing this and then suddenly a different song appeared on the screen, but we're definitely doing this today, um, King of Kings, Majesty. kind of king where we need to keep ourselves distant from you. 
You're not the kind of king who says that we have to behave in a certain way and be a certain type of person and be born into a certain class before we can come face to face with you. You are the God, the king who spreads his arms open wide, so wide that they embrace all of us. So wide that they can be nailed to the cross. And you embrace us and you draw us to you and say to us, you are my child. And so we come and we worship you today. We give you thanks because you are the God who though the sun might be shining upon us today uh, and, and maybe not every day, but every day your light shines on us. And so we praise you and worship you because even though at times we might feel like the darkness is overcoming us, your light always shines. All we need to do is lift our eyes up to you and have that reassurance that you love us and you are always with us. We give you thanks and praise and glory today. We thank you that you love us so much that you sent your Son to walk amongst us, to die on a cross, and to rise again, so that in your dying our sins are forgiven, and in your resurrection we are invited into sharing eternal life with you. And so we praise you and honour you and worship you today. And as we come into your presence, as we sit ourselves down at the feet of your throne and look up to you and in awe and wonder, we recognize that in ourselves there are failings, there are shortcomings, there are sins in our lives that keep us from being so close to you. But God, we also know that if we confess these sins, you will forgive us and those sins will be, will be wiped away from us. So that there will be nothing that can separate us from you. And as we confess these sins to you in this moment, we confess them with, with, with hearts uh, of, 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 of being contrite in our hearts. Um, we, we confess them knowing that there are things that we, we would wish that we could we have never done. Uh, but we also confess them with joy in our hearts knowing that, that you are going to forgive us. Because the promise you made to forgive us is, is a promise that we keep. And so we give you thanks because in this moment of confession and of forgiveness, we live out your gospel. We live out that gospel truth. That nothing need separate us from you no more. You love the world so much that you gave your only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It is in that moment of belief that we receive forgiveness. And so we give you thanks and praise and honour and glory in the name of Jesus. And we say together the, the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We come on to our announcements uh, for the week and the, and the weeks that lie ahead of us um, to, to remind you and let you know what is happening. Um, before we get up, and if you've got the dates for the diary up there, okay, so let's run through those quickly first. So, to remind you that this Tuesday um, at, at, um, at 8 o'clock, we have our weekly prayer meeting. Uh, we weren't able to meet last week, but we will meet this week. Uh, and we will meet um, online and in person. We, we would have tried to have met in person last week, but we'll meet online and in person on Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock. So either upstairs in the sanctuary or on Zoom, whichever is most suitable for yourself. Next Sunday, the 4th of July, we gather together for Holy Communion, the first Sunday uh, of the month. And then I'm going to be away for two weeks from the 5th of July to the 19th of July. And so you'll see that on Sunday, the 11th of July, Robert will be here with you um, to share God's message with you and lead in the worship. And then the following Sunday, Brian uh, will be leading the worship and, and sharing God's message with you. So that's what um, July looks like. I will then be back on the 25th of July.
Winston has some copies of the latest Daily Bread. Uh, some of you who, who would normally ask for them, whether you're an angel or not, will have received. Um, and if you would like one but you don't normally get one, Winston has some extra copies. So do uh, catch Winston on the way out um, and ask him for any extra copies that he has um, if you don't have one. As far as birthdays go, I'm aware of two that I'm not part of the, the folk who are here, folk who would normally watch us online. Is anybody here whose birthday we need to celebrate and, and sing happy birthday to? So, so today is Anna Clark's birthday. Anna watches us and joins us online. So we want to wish Anna, we want to wish you a very happy birthday today. And in a moment we will sing for you. And then also somebody else that joins us online, Doug Gill. Doug is celebrating his birthday on Thursday. And so Doug, we want to wish you a very happy birthday um, for Thursday um, as well. So we're going to sing happy birthday uh, to Doug and to Anna. <laughs> I know, I know school holidays have just started, you're thinking, more tests. Yeah. I'm going to put three pictures up together on the screen. Do you want to put the first one up? And this is what I want to know from you. I want to know which two pictures belong to each other. Which two pictures out of those three belong to each other? Anybody want to tell me? Robin, can you work it out? Which two belong together? Do you want mommy to tell us on your behalf? <laughs> the rabbit and the carrots. Why do the rabbit and the carrots go together? It's not a difficult answer. <laughs> because the rabbit eats the carrots. Does anybody have a different answer of which two go together? <laughs> Yeah, I'm asking the children, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't help, Ron. Margaret. Do like parents as well? Okay, I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you say, Jay? Which two do you think go together? I think the rabbits and the dog because they're both animals. Because they're both animals. So, so, so the rabbit and the dog could belong together. Again, this is terrible that I have to get people who know the answer to tell me the answer. Um, so, so, so the rabbit and the dog could belong together because, because they're both animals. Or, or the rabbit and the carrot could belong together because the rabbit eats carrots. Let's draw the next one. Which, which two pictures belong together? Yes. The crown and the crown and the union flag. Why do they belong together? Because they're both to do with England or, or, or the United Kingdom or Great Britain, whatever. You want to add to that? Um, anybody got a different answer? <laughs> you have an American friend who wears a crown? No, okay. Right. <laughs> Any other answer that it could be that, that belong together? The two flags. All right, so, so the pictures on either side could belong together. So, so either the union flag and the, and the crown um, could belong together or or the Union flag and the Stars and Stripes um, because they're both flags. And then one more. Alright. Which two belong together in, in those pictures? Leisha. 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 Snow White. I told you you're going to see Snow White today. Which two belong together in that picture? Sorry? Snow White. Snow White and the apple? Could, could there be another answer? Could there be two others that belong together? 
Yeah, if you want to know, I'm not sure that's Rapunzel. Just for those who haven't watched any Disney princess movies in the last 20 years. Um, so, knowing that that's a Disney princess, are there any other two that could belong together in that picture? Snow White and Rapunzel, because they're both Disney princesses, so they could belong together. So what we've seen is that, that under different circumstances, there can be a different sense of belonging. So if you look at things differently, so, so either Rapunzel and Snow White belong together because they're both Disney princesses, or, or um, Snow White and the apple belong together because we know that in the story of Snow White, um, she eats a poisoned apple. And, and, and so they could belong together. And it's the same way with all of us as we grow up. We change in what we belong to. Sometimes we belong to something, and sometimes we belong to something else. And I was thinking of you this morning, Sophie, because, because last month you belonged to Moneymore Primary School. But in two months' time, you're going to belong to Cookstown High School. So, so, so that, that change of, I belong to this, and now I belong to that. And, and as, we, as we grow up, we might belong to lots of different things. We might belong to a football club, or we might belong to one of the Orange Lodges. Uh, or we might belong to um, a, a particular workplace. But then things change. When you're, when you're little, you belong to your mum and your daddy. But as you get older, um, you don't belong to them anymore because you now go off and, and, and you've grown up and, and now you maybe start your own family and, and you belong to them. Uh, and so that sense of belonging changes um, as we grow up and as we get older and as things change in our lives. But there's one thing that doesn't change when it comes to belonging, is our belonging to God. We always belong to God. And we're, we're going to think about that in the sermon in a little while, about how we belong to God, how we've always belonged to God. Things might change. We might belong to this primary school, and then we belong to that high school, and then we belong to that college or university, and those things change. But the one thing that will never change, and as you grow up and as you get older, this is important that you remember, is that we always belong to God. Right from the very beginning, when you were in your mommy's tummy, and your mum didn't even know you were growing in your mum's tummy, God knew that you were there. And you belong to him already. He was busy at work stitching you together and making sure that you were being formed in your mother's body. And, and one day you would come out and then your parents would go, wow, this beautiful child belongs to us. But you've always belonged to God. And whatever circumstances change in your life, you will always belong to God. So we're going to pray and we're going to thank God that in all the changing things in our lives, the one thing that doesn't change is how much he loves us and that he wants us to remember that we belong to him. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you love us so much that you never let us go. That even before anybody knew that we were existing and, 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 and becoming this, this, this person growing inside of our mother's body, um, before anybody knew that, you knew that. And you looked at us and you thought, this is my precious child. And you shaped us and you formed us and you never stopped throughout our lives. You've always shaped and formed us and being there and, and always saying, this is my child. And so we thank you, God, that as, as things change all around us, the one thing that never changes is how much you love us and that we can always turn to you and you are always there for us. And we thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're, we're going to turn to our Bibles. Um, we've, we've been looking through Mark, Mark's Gospel and we we'll continue to do that today. We're looking at Mark chapter 5, uh, verses 21 to 43. Um, some of the story might be very familiar to you. Um, it is a long reading, but we're not going to look at um, the whole passage. We're going to look at one or two points that jump out um, at us. But we're going to read from Matthew chapter 5. We're going to begin at verse 21 and we're going to move on to verse 43. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. 
So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed round him. And a woman who was there, was there, who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned round in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. But when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, What is all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her hand and said to her, Talithe kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told him to give her something to eat. We end our evening to thank God for his wonderful, wonderful word. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for the story that gives us hope and joy. Knowing that even though things might seem like there is no hope in them, in you there is always hope. That there is always healing and restoration that there is always freedom and, and, and how we long for it in our lives and how we look for it in so many places and how we think that we found it but then things change and, and then we haven't found it. But in you we can find all these things. The story tells us that we can find the freedom and the healing and the restoration that we so desire. We can find it in you. So prepare our hearts, Lord, for this word today. Prepare our lives for the changes that we might want to make in them so that we can be faithful as followers of Jesus. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yesterday we had a, a lovely picnic and a lovely walk out in, in, in a forest and, a, and I cannot pronounce the name today, I'm not going to tell you the name of the forest. It's the one, sorry? That one. The one just the other side of uh, Castle Caulfield. Um, and, and it was really, it was, it was the, some of the folk who had been doing um, the well-being groups uh, during February, March and April and, and at the end of the groups they we, well, the, the group wanted to meet up for a picnic and a, and a walk together, um, and, and it really was lovely. The weather was perfect on this, and the scenery was just beautiful. Um, and during our conversations, um, someone asked Joanne and me if, um, with having moved so far away from home uh, and, and moved about so often, um, whether we struggle with a sense of belonging. And, and our answer had to be yes. Yes, we had. Um, when I was younger, it seemed like all I ever wanted to do was just to get as far away from my hometown as possible, just to go out and explore uh, and, and to see the world. Um, but as time went on, as I moved further and further away, that all changed. And, and there came a point of trying to find a way back home, a way back to, to, to where, where, where I belong. Um, and that's not always easy when home is, is not a physical place. 
when, whenever we go on holiday to South Africa, whenever we plan and pack and we're, we're going to South Africa on holiday, we always say that we're going home. Uh, but then when we've been there for two or three weeks and, and our flight is a day or two away and we've got to start packing up again, then we always say we're going back home now. Uh, and, and, and so it seems like um, we're, we're always traveling to a place called home, but, but never actually getting there, never actually finding it. And, and perhaps that is the story of, of all people, just trying to find a place that we can call home, trying to find a place of belonging, of, of acceptance, uh, but never quite finding it where we are. We, we, we read in today's passage the stories of, of two very, very different people. We've got Jairus, who is a leader of a synagogue, who, who is someone prominent enough in the community that his name is known. Peter knew his name. Mark, who then wrote Peter's stories, knew his name. Jairus was somebody who, who was accepted and prominent enough in his community that we are told what his name is. And then we have this unnamed woman. This woman who has been ill for the past 12 years with an illness that, that, that causes hemorrhage, hemorrhage and that causes bleeding. And, and, and she is just a, a nameless face in the crowd. And to the best of her abilities, a, a face lost in the crowd. Um, two very different people. Jairus who has a place of acceptability in his community, so much so that it allows him to approach Jesus and, and speak to Jesus and, and beg Jesus for healing. And he sits in contrast to this woman who, who, as I said, is just this face in the crowd, this, this anonymous person who has to secretly reach out and not even touch Jesus, but at least just try and touch the hem of his cloak, knowing that if she does that, there's a really good chance that she will be healed. Two very different people, two people in need of the same thing. Healing. Jairus for his daughter and the woman for herself. And both know that they will find that that they're looking for in Jesus. If Jairus' daughter was near death, then she had probably been sick for a while. Which means that her father had probably looked in a lot of different places for that healing. Different doctors, different healers, tried different medicines, different herbal remedies in the hope that something will work and that he will find what he is looking for in all these places that he is looking for. But what we learn from the story is that the only place that he can find the healing, the only place that he can find the restoration, the only place that he can find what he is so desperate for in his life is in Jesus. And it's the same with the woman too. She has been struggling for 12 years with this illness that she doesn't seem to be able to find a cure for. It tells us that she has been to different doctors, she's tried different things, she's worked and, and, and done things to desperately try and find this healing that she so desperately needs. But when she hears about Jesus, when she hears people talking about Jesus, about what he has done, about what they've seen him do, what they've experienced him do, and that word reaches her, she knows that the only place that she can find all of this that she has been looking for in all these different places is in Jesus. But there's something else about this woman's story that really captivates me, that really draws me in, that draws me towards Jesus. We need to think of her backstory, we need to think of her context and her circumstance of her illness. The Jews of that day would have stuck to some very strict um, law, purity laws that were given, by, uh, given to Moses and, and recorded in the Old Testament. Leviticus 15 verses 25 to 27 tells us that because of her illness, she would have been considered unclean. She would have been an outcast in her community. She would have been banished. And anybody who touched her would have been considered unclean as well. For at least the rest of that day, until sunset, until they'd gone through ritual cleaning, they would have been considered unclean to you. Which probably explains why she secretly stuck out her arm and at least just touched Jesus' clothes, knowing that if she touched him, he would be unclean too. This woman for 12 years was an outcast. 
For 12 years, she was considered unclean and someone to be avoided. For 12 years, she was rejected. She felt dejected. She was alone. She was banished. She was a woman with no sense of place, no sense of identity, no sense of belonging. And in a moment of encountering Jesus, all of that changes. When Jesus restores her, when Jesus heals her, he does so much more than heal her physically. Because in that moment of physical healing, in that moment when her bleeding stops, not only is her physical health restored, but so is her place in her family. So is her place in her community. In that moment of encountering Jesus, once again, she belongs. Like so many of us in this world, what this woman wanted was far more than just physical restoration. She needed to be restored emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. She wanted to feel that she belonged. And, and we see this repeated over and over and over again in the Gospel. The rejected and the excluded restored. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, shunned by his fellow Jews. The lepers, excluded and banished from their towns. The demon possessed, feared and to be avoided. But when they encounter Jesus, when Jesus transforms their lives, they belong once again. It is the story of the prodigal son who, although he has a place of belonging in his father's home, chooses to do things his own way, goes off and, and meets with other people and forms friends and social circles in places, but eventually he comes to that point where he is alone, where he is abandoned by those who have welcomed him and given him a false sense of belonging, and he realizes that the one place where he will be accepted, the one place where he will be welcomed, and loved, the one place where he will belong is in his father's home. And so he finds the road, he finds the way that will take him back to his father. It is the story of all of humanity. The opening chapters of Genesis tell us that we belong to God. God created everything, including us. David puts it like this in Psalm 24, the words that were up on the screen earlier. The earth belongs to the Lord, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. We belong to God, but we choose our own way. We, we moved away from Him, and over time we have tried to find our place of belonging, but all those places pass away, and so we move on to the next place hoping that here we will find a place where we belong. But like the prodigal son, what we need to realize is that we have always had a place of belonging. We have always had a place of acceptance and of love. And that place is with God, our Father. <clears throat> and like the prodigal son, we need to find the road, to find the way that will take us to that place where we belong. But how can we know the way? That's the question that Philip asks Jesus. That's a question that echoes through all of humanity, in every voice, in every accent. How can I know the way back to the Father? It's the desperate cry of the lost and the rejected and the desperate and the excluded and the despised and the marginalized. How can we know the way to the Father? And then Jesus replies, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This desperate, rejected and feared woman knows that Jesus is not just the way to physical healing, but Jesus is the way to full restoration. Jesus is the way to the place of being loved and accepted and celebrated. He is the way that will take her to a place where she belongs once again. Not just for her, but for all of us. Jesus is the way that brings us back to that place where we all belong. So if you're searching, 
if you're wondering, if you're asking where is it that I belong, where is it that I will be accepted and loved and celebrated, the answer is in God. In God you are loved just as you are. In God you are accepted simply because you are you. In God you are celebrated because you are a work of love. Because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Because God looks at you and says, you are my child and I love you so much. It's in God that we find our place of belonging. It's in God that we have always belonged. No matter how much we search in different places, no matter how many times we go, yes, I really feel like I belong here. I really feel like I belong in a part of this football club. I really feel like I belong in this school. I really feel that I belong in this workplace. I really feel that I belong in this community. Things change, circumstances change, and we move on to another school, or we're too old to continue playing football, and circumstances change, and suddenly we're looking for the next place that we might belong. We've always belonged in God. From the time that you were formed in your mother's womb, before your parents even knew that there was this life growing inside of your mother's womb, God knew and you belong to him. He knew all about you. He loved you and he was looking out for you. You belong to him. You have always belonged to him. You will always belong to him. I might search for places and there will be times when I feel that I belong here. There will be times when I feel that I'm not in a place where I belong. But what I know and what I try to hold on to, and what we need to hold on to, is that we all belong to God. We always have. And if we're not sure of that, if we don't know how to get back to that place of belonging, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes back to the Father except through Him. Let us pray. Thank you, God, that you love us so, so much. That your arms are open wide to welcome all back to you. Open so wide that you can be nailed to the cross. So that you can show us how much you love us. That you can welcome us back and say, here, here is where you belong with me. You might look in different places, but here is where you belong. Because from the right from the very beginning, from that moment when the man and the woman were formed out of the dust of the earth, we belonged to him. From the moment that we were just a speck of life in our mother's womb, we belonged to God and we continue to belong to God. And if we if we receive Jesus in us as our Lord and Savior for all eternity, we will belong to God. And we will never have to wander again. And so God, I thank you for that. I thank you for that reassurance that we have, that we belong to you. The reassurance that the woman had, she reached out to touch her and knowing that in Jesus, she would belong once again. And that truth is true for each one of us. In Jesus, we will belong to the Father. At least we will know that we belong to the Father and feel that we belong to the Father once again. We have always belonged to you. And we pray today, God, for those who are so desperately seeking for that restoration and for that healing and that wholeness and that feeling of, of I belong to God. You feel so overwhelmed because they are unwell. Or because the darkness of life seems to be overcoming them. And they feel abandoned and alone. And if they open their eyes, they will see that spark of light. It says, No, I'm here. You belong to me. I thank you for that, God. And I pray for each person who needs to hear that today, that they belong to you. And I thank you, God, that each one of us here belongs to you. And also that we belong to one another. 
that we encourage one another and that we love one another and that we remind one another God loves us and we belong to Him. And sometimes we can find things difficult and hard. And then someone comes alongside us and says, We belong to one another and we belong to our Father in heaven. And He loves us and will never leave us and will carry us through this. Thank you, God, for your church, for the community of people who recognize that we belong to one another, and we walk difficult paths together, and we point you out to us when we're struggling to see you in all of us. <clears throat> so I pray your blessing on us. I pray that as we go out into the world, we will remind people of where their belonging really is, of where the answer to all the questions they are asking is, of where they can find the path that will lead them to life and light and love. And that maybe sometimes we won't even need to tell them because they will just see it in us. And they will look at us and go, whatever journey you want, I want to be on that journey too. And we will say, come along. Because there is a Father in heaven he loves you. And you're standing on this road with open arms ready to receive you. Thank you, God, that you love us so much. Thank you that you never give up on us. Thank you that you're walking every step of the way with us. Thank you that you call us your Father, that you call, that you call us your children, and we can call you our Father, because we belong to one another. In Jesus' name. Amen. And to sing together our closing hymn, Jesus is the name of God. <coughs> Joanne, Rachel, Bianca and I 
um, will be leaving the Cooks Down South Derry circuit in July next year. Um, since before we were married, Joanne and I have believed that God has called us to minister together. And over the past year, we've come to realize that that, that ministry isn't in circuit ministry. And so, um, in the last month, I have applied um, to be without pastoral charge, uh, and this was approved in the past week. What that means is that while I remain an ordained minister within the Methodist Church uh, in Ireland, we will be moving from the circuit. Um, but from July next year, I won't be stationed um, as a minister in, in any other circuit. So I will be a minister in the Methodist Church, but I won't be looking after any particular church. Um, instead, what we will be doing is, is moving into our own home. Um, we'll be looking for employment. Um, and alongside our jobs, we are also planning to develop um, an evangelism ministry um, that will invite people into that relationship with Jesus that we have found ourselves. Now, the stand-up might come as a surprise um, to some of you um, this morning. And if you would like to talk to us, if you'd like to find out a little bit more about what we're doing, please come and chat to, to Joanne and I. Our door um, is always open. Um, we will, as I said, we will be with you for the next 12 months. We will be here until um, July next year. Um, in October um, or September, when the stationing process begins once again, uh, then the station committee will be looking to station another minister here to move in um, in June or July um, next year. Uh, I wanted to share that with you this morning um, just to let you know uh, what was happening. So, shall we share the grace? Yeah. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forever. Amen. Amen.